This isn't my story. It's my friend's. He gave me permission to share it because he isn't the best writer. He has assured me that it is 100% true, and I have never known him to lie. I'll use the first person narrative for this story. When I was in junior high school, dares and tests of courage were all the rage. So one summer night, while I was out with a group of friends, we decided to dare each other to do things. Our dares weren't so crazy, just simple things. I guess it was more about having something to do rather than daring each other. In the area I lived in, there was a small hill, and at night it gets very dark, as there aren't many streetlights up there. It was perfect. There was a certain kind of atmosphere there. On top of that hill was a sports ground. It was like a large oval shape. The light was very sparse up there, so it was pretty eerie. So me and some friends set off for the sports ground, and we were all excited when we got to the top of the hill. That excitement was short-lived for me though because I saw a humanoid figure stood just close to a dark area. It was just beyond the reach of the street light, and it was hardly visible. To be honest, I was really creeped out by it. I didn't want to run into some stranger up here in the dark, that is if it was human. My mind was racing. Some of my idiotic friends started shouting at the figure. Another one of my friends started visibly shaking. I guess they were more scared than I was, which didn't seem possible. I asked my friend what was wrong. She just shook her head from side to side, and she seemed too scared to speak. I was scared now, and it seemed like that figure off in the darkness was starting to edge closer in our direction. I called out to my friends and suggested that we should head back down. We left our bikes at the bottom of the hill. Walking down that hill, with only the moonlight to guide us, was really scary. I think everyone was thinking the same thoughts as our pace got quicker and quicker along the way. Suddenly, my friend who couldn't speak earlier stopped and said that she needed to use the restroom. Great, I thought. A little ways down from the sports ground was a public restroom. It was just an isolated building off from the path. We all decided that we couldn't just leave her there to use the restroom alone, so we said that we would go in with her. I wanted to get out of there as soon as possible, so I asked her to hurry up. I hated that building in the daytime and at night, with those thoughts of that shadowy humanoid figure still fresh in my mind, I was getting really spooked. The lights in that bathroom were on a motion sensor, so when we went in, the lights went on. We went in there and we all quickly noticed that one of the stalls was shut, and the red indicator above the door handle was showing red. It was locked. This was very weird because the lights were off when we arrived, and like I said, the lights were motion sensor activated. So, if someone was in that stall, it seems very strange that the lights would be out. We quickly used the facilities, and everyone was catching their breath and enjoying being in the light for a few moments. We started talking and decided to head back down the hill. While we were talking, we heard a noise, which made all of us jump. We heard the lock to the stall behind us pop open. Well, we all ran as fast as we could. Maybe we wouldn't have if we didn't see that disturbing figure out by the sports ground. We managed to make it down the hill without issue. And then when we got to our bikes, we rode them home in silence. The next morning we heard some news. It turned out that a body was found in that public restroom on the hill. Apparently someone was hanging by their neck in one of the stalls. Could the body have been in there while we used the bathroom that night? There are a couple of things that don't add up about that night to me. If someone went there to take their own life that night, then why did we hear the stall door unlock? Was that shadowy figure up on the sports ground related in any way to the body in the stall? I researched that park and it wasn't the first or last incident where someone was found hung in the stalls. It seems like 
It is a place where people choose to end things. It's all so sad, but for me, there's something really disturbing about that figure out there. That night, in the dark. This happened in my home a few years ago. Whenever I get out of the bath, I usually sit on the edge of it and mess around with my phone while the bathroom is still warm. It's a habit of mine. One time when I got out of the bath to sit on the edge like always, I heard something. My home is a little different than most, I guess. The bathroom is on the bottom floor rather than the top. So after I cooled down, I went upstairs. Before I went into my bedroom, I heard a splash of water. It wasn't like a drop of water dripping into the tub, it sounded like something was thrown in the water. It was loud enough for me to hear it all the way upstairs. Now, I'm usually the last person to take a bath or use the bathroom in my family, and usually by the time I finish in there, everyone's asleep. No one was downstairs, and everyone was in bed. Plus, like any normal person, I drained the bath. I was a little concerned, so I headed back downstairs to the bathroom to check it out. Before I got into the bathroom, I heard the shower come on. Like, really high pressure bursts of water shot out of it. I saw it as I went in there. Now, you know my habit. It's not like I would sit at the edge of the tub with the shower blasting behind me. There's no chance of that happening. I wondered if something fell over that made the shower come on, but I couldn't see anything out of place in the bathroom. Then I heard the sound of something playing on my computer at maximum volume from the living room. It stopped before I managed to get to open the living room door. I was pretty creeped out at this point. I didn't want to go into the living room, so I headed back to my bedroom. As I ran upstairs, I heard the sound of the computer playing something at full volume once again, and then suddenly stopping. From that night forward, the mysterious activity would continuously occur. It got worse because it began to happen in my bedroom. It started with the lights. Even though I had just replaced the bulb, it went out. When I got on the ladder to replace it again, the glass bulb shattered close to my face. It shattered into such small pieces that it's a miracle I didn't get any in my eyes. I went to the store the next day to ask about it, and they believed that a short circuit wouldn't cause the bulb to shatter like that. I even spoke to an electrician, and he couldn't explain why that happened. I used a battery-powered lamp for a while after that just in case there was an issue with the circuit board. Well, things got worse. All the electronic devices in my bedroom, including my cell phone, began to fail or break. I took my phone to the store, and they couldn't figure out the fault with it. I remember one staff member said, There's nothing about this in the manual. I borrowed an old phone off a friend, and strangely enough, that phone didn't break. Nothing happened to it. The next strange thing to happen was, again, related to the electronics in my room. Things like remotes, my music player, and controllers would all be lined up neatly on my bed when I came home. I didn't leave them like that when I left. I'm guessing you're the same as me, right? You just leave these things anywhere, and you never line them up nicely in a certain area. It was so weird. Then suspicion crept into my mind. Could someone be messing with me? I wondered. I have a little brother, and the reason I was suspicious was because all this mysterious activity seemed to only be happening to me, so I made sure to lock my room every time I left it, and I held onto the key. I didn't leave the key somewhere where someone could get it, I kept it in my pocket. But the result didn't change. The electronics were lined up on my bed, time after time. I haven't been harmed by a spirit or even seen one, but things were getting frightening for me. I was suspecting the paranormal at this point. I didn't think that this phenomenon would subside anytime soon. So I decided on doing something a little unusual. I suggested going to a shrine with my family, and they were into the idea. Maybe they could see how distressed I was getting. In Japan, Visiting and praying at a shrine is a good way to ward off evil spirits. I prayed there, and I even bought a kind of religious talisman. When I got back, all of the mysterious phenomenon abruptly stopped. 
Even today, years later, I still have no clue what started all that. I'm still sleeping in the same room, and all the weird stuff's just a distant memory. I think it could have been a poltergeist. I was traveling by car from Tokyo back to Iwate to visit my parents. It was late night. I was on the express highway until about midnight, and then I turned down a pitch black country road. I was gunning it at about 60. There were no other cars on the road. It was pretty sweet. The road seemed to be never ending. I had forgotten how long it took to get back home. It was a nice night to go for a drive though, but it felt like it was taking forever to get home. I saw a tunnel up ahead, and as I entered it, I heard that vroom kind of sound. I love that. Suddenly, something appeared in my rearview mirror. A huge, bright yellow truck. It pulled up right behind me and stayed tight to my bumper. I was left little of a choice than to speed up. I started to panic. Despite the fact that I had sped up, I had created no distance between me and that truck. It was deliberately staying right behind me. Panic turned to anger, and I began cursing the driver behind me. I remembered that there was a rest area just outside the tunnel, and I decided that as soon as I got out of that tunnel, I would pull over and let this jerk overtake me. When I saw the exit of the tunnel, I turned on my indicator good and early. I broke out of the tunnel and veered off onto the road, onto the hard shoulder. I spun my head around to get a look at the driver who had been almost bumper to bumper with me. But when I turned around in my seat, I couldn't see the truck. We were going so fast and it was so loud that there was no way that I wouldn't have noticed the truck passing me. It wasn't as if there was anything obstructing my view of the tunnel. The truck was big and yellow too, and it had its headlights on. I couldn't see it anywhere. I sat there confused, wondering what the hell was going on, when I heard. It was the sound of someone banging on the driver's side window of my car. Naturally, it scared the crap out of me, so I leapt in my seat. I heard someone out there apologize. I looked through the window and saw a woman. She looked to be about 25 or 26. I rolled down the window a little. I'm so sorry for startling you. My car broke down and I asked my husband to come pick me up, but I've been waiting and waiting so long. He hasn't turned up. My phone is out of power, and I can't get in touch with him. Please could you let me borrow your phone? I'll be quick." She said something like that. Of course I allowed her to use my phone. I handed it over, with a smile. I offered her a seat in my car, out of the cold, while she used my phone, and she thanked me for it. Shortly after, she handed my phone back, and she appeared to be on the verge of tears. The atmosphere was heavy, and conversation had ceased between us. Is he on his way? I asked quietly. <laughs> I have to wait a bit longer, she said with a nervous laugh, trying to stifle the tears. I didn't like this stilted and awkward vibe, so I decided to speak about the incident with the yellow truck. She patiently listened to my story without giving me eye contact. I was speaking of how the truck was speeding up behind me, making me panic, when she said, Stop, you're scaring me. She sounded angry. We switched up the conversation, and she brought up a tsunami which ravaged the area a few years ago. While she was talking, my stomach rumbled. She laughed. She laughed and said that she had some snacks in her car. She left to go get them. I watched her approach a grey car ahead of mine on the hard shoulder. I wasn't paying much attention. I was just gazing out of the window when my phone rang. The incoming call was from a number I didn't recognise. Ah, it must be that lady's husband. So with that in mind, I quickly answered the call. I heard a young voice on the end of the line. Hello, I had a missed call from this number. Who is this, please? Ah, you must be Mr. Nakano, right? Yeah, the thing is, I'm actually with your wife now. I went on to explain what had happened. I find that story quite hard to believe since my wife has sat here with me. Are you sure you got the right number? He replied. This was... This was weird. To double check, I asked him if he lived in the area that the woman had told me about, and he confirmed that he did. 
I heard a woman's voice in the background while he was talking ask, Hey, what's wrong? What happened? I was really confused. I began to get out of my car and approach the woman. L let me just put her on the phone to you. I'm sure she will straighten things out. I approached the car ahead, and I had noticed that it had been broke down for a long while. It was rusted, and it had moss growing all over it. Ivy was curling round and gripping the tires. The woman was nowhere in sight. She certainly wasn't in the car. I went to put my ear back to my phone, but the man had hung up. I had so many things to ask him. I didn't want to call him back though. Maybe I should have. To warn him? Or to find out why a woman was alone in the dead of night waiting for him? None of this made sense. Not the truck, nor the woman. I didn't tell this story to anyone yet, but... But when I go back to Tokyo, I know I won't be going through that tunnel. This happened about two years ago. My hobby is fishing, in mountain streams, headwaters mainly. It's the point where one body of water empties out into another. Luckily, I had headwaters not too far from my house, and I used to fish there quite frequently. It took about 30 minutes to get there by car. The flow of the river wasn't too strong, and it wasn't ever crowded, so it was no danger to go there alone. I remember that it was March, and I went fishing the day after an unusually heavy night of rainfall. In order to get to my favorite fishing spot, you need to cross over a dam. I saw a huge deer that day by the dam. Usually the deer run when they sense the presence of humans, but that day, the deer didn't. I looked around and saw a small fawn at the bottom of the dam. Perhaps it had slipped down there, I thought. Maybe the bigger deer I saw was one of its parents. It was too late for the fawn. It looked already cold. The bigger deer moved off into the forest. I felt that it must have been sad. I felt something too for that poor deer. Little did I know, it was an omen and things were about to get a lot worse. My mood shifted a little. The day seemed to be a bit darker. Perhaps it was because I had just witnessed the harsh reality of life. I began to set up my rod to do some fishing. I saw no tracks of any other anglers in the vicinity. I had the place to myself. Sometimes in this river you can find some rare fish, and usually days like this are perfect conditions for fishing, but I just couldn't shake that odd feeling I had. I couldn't fish right either. I kept hooking my line in weeds beneath the surface, tree roots and between rocks. I thought that this was likely due to the heavy rain the night before deplacing things beneath the surface, but now I kind of think it was a warning, don't go any further. I also slipped on my ass and I hurt my knee. But then things picked up, I caught some fish and that's always fun. I got into my rhythm and I didn't want to stop. I wanted to move into another area I call the two pools. There was a base level pool, surrounded by huge rocks, an ideal place for fishing, and above there was another pool. I clambered my way over the rocks and grazed my right arm and elbow in the process to get there, but when I did, I sighed in relief and decided on taking a rest. Everything looked pretty much the same, apart from the water levels being a little higher due to the night of rain. Something was off though, the whole atmosphere of the place seemed different somehow. Usually around the two pools there is a gentle breeze coming from downstream, but that day it was as if there was no wind at all, just a strange and eerie stillness. I didn't hear a single bird chirp, nothing seemed to be moving beneath the water below either. I cast my rod off, because that was what I was there to do, and I didn't get so much as a nibble. I thought that I would try my luck in the higher pool. I thought I heard a fish breaching the surface up there. You have to climb to get to this higher pool. You need to navigate around rocks, but it's not so dangerous. When I reached the top, I flicked my line in the pool expecting nothing, but to my surprise, something was almost instantly on the line. 
something big. It was about 50 centimeters long. It looked like a trout, yet it was all skin and bones. It was incredibly thin. In such a food-rich mountain stream, never have I seen such a creepy, slender fish. It made me want to go home. I let the fish go and began to pack up my rod. I turned back to leave the way I came and I was astonished to see that the usual way I had gone for years was now blocked. Blocked by mossy, ancient boulders and trees which looked as if they had been there for decades. Was I losing the plot? Or did I just lose my way? I wanted to get out of there. I panicked and scrabbled around, trying to find another way back down. I found a way back down to the lower pool eventually. I crept down over the slippery rocks. Without thinking about it, I jumped down and I managed to keep my foothold and I headed away from the pools. Then I heard a voice call. Hey. It sounded as if it came from directly above my head. I looked up, expecting to see a human figure peering over the cliffs above, but I saw nothing. I took a few steps back to the edge of the rock that I was balanced on to get a better look. I grabbed the tree branch to hoist myself up, to get a little higher, and the moment I did so, I heard a voice from behind me. Hey. The boulder I was balanced on began to slip beneath my feet. Had I not grabbed onto the tree branch, I would have been dragged down with it into the pool below. I felt like it fell into the abyss. When the water and the rockfall settled, I made it back down to the sandy edge of the bottom pool, with both of my feet trembling. My whole body was covered in goosebumps, yet drenched in sweat at the same time. This is the closest I've ever been to death. Where did that voice come from? There was no one in sight. I hadn't seen anyone there that day. I found my way back to the path and I walked down. Everything was different though. I just wanted to leave that place as soon as possible. I ran down the river. The river was the only thing which hadn't changed. The next day, I spoke about what had happened with my neighbor. He was an older gentleman who had been fishing in these parts his whole life. He said something that resonated with me, be it true or not, is what he said. Uh, I wonder if that's the call of the river, or perhaps the call of the mountains, maybe one of them. Yeah, there's days where the rivers call, and days where the mountains call. Maybe invite is a better word, maybe persuade, manipulate, trick, however you want to see it. On days like that, when you hear something, or see something, that isn't quite right. You better not go so deep into the wilderness. Now, I live by that advice. This is a true and mysterious event which happened to me and some friends one summer night a few years ago. Every summer, a couple of old school best friends and I get together and we go on a little trip together. On the year this occurred, we had all decided on renting a cottage in the woods. It was going to be great. We were going to have a barbecue and a campfire. It was the usual crew, me and two friends. We're all females, by the way. My friend drove, and it took us hours to get there. It was already evening by the time we got to the cottage, and we were all hungry. We had prepared for this, though. We brought all our barbecue gear, and we were ready to have a feast. We had a great night, chatting and reminiscing by the log fire, and of course, eating way too much. Even though it was summer, the sun had already set by about 8pm. So that was our call to head back into the cottage. It was a real shame though. I suddenly had the urge to go to a hot spring. I know this sounds a little odd, but it's called an onsen in Japanese, and we love going to them in summer. I mentioned it to my friends, and everyone was on board. We got fired up, since we were all tired and full. Well, the cottage didn't have a hot spring, so we hit a dead end. Not wanting to slow down or waste the trip, I got my phone out and started googling to see if there were any springs nearby, and we were in luck. There was one only a short drive away. We quickly packed some of our clothes and jumped back in the car, since we weren't familiar with the area. We were completely dependent on the car navigation system. 
The narrow roads were so dark since the forest was all around us. I didn't want to get lost out here. I was starting to lose faith in my idea. But then we turned onto the highway. The mood lifted in the car, and we were back to chatting and laughing. Right. The car navigation system interrupted. It was just the one word. I noticed this because the sat-nav system said, After 100 meters, turn right. I thought it was odd, but I didn't care that much. Another odd thing was that it asked us to turn while we were in a curve in the road. We turned back a little, and at the exact same point in the road, the satellite navigation system said, Right. These country roads were very narrow. We didn't see the dirt road the first time, but spotted it when we doubled back. We obeyed the sat-nav and turned down the dirt road. The laughter and sense of excitement in the car ebbed away and was replaced by a sense of anxiety. This road, it didn't seem like it was leading us to the hot springs. The forest road just got steeper and steeper and darker and darker. I felt as if we were moving further from the town and from people. I started to doubt the existence of the hot springs. We ceased talking at this point. The air in the car was thick with tension. I wanted to turn back, but I knew that we couldn't. The road was only just wide enough for our car. There was no way we could do a U-turn. I started to worry. What might happen if an oncoming car came at us at full speed? Since we didn't know where we were, we decided that we would stop the car and check out our surroundings. I was amazed to discover that we were nearing a cliff edge. I had no idea that we had driven this high up into the mountains. I was lost for words, and so were my friends. Fear now had a grip on us. Forget the hot springs, we just needed to get back. Get back to somewhere familiar. No one said a word, and I'm glad they didn't because I was just panicking. We just stared at one another's faces in the dark and wondered what to do. We had no choice but to keep going forward, because the road was simply not wide enough to turn back. I knew deep down that we were moving further and further from the town, from the people, and from the lights. Just as our anxiety reached its peak, my friend spotted something up in the road ahead. The road widened ahead. Relieved, we sped towards it to perform the U-turn that would get us out of the mountainous woods. Then, the car's headlights illuminated a building. A building almost crumbled to ruins. A derelict and frightening looking place. And in that moment we laid eyes on it, we heard, You have arrived at your destination. Then, the power in the car went out. We were plunged into darkness. We panicked, but it came back on instantaneously. We turned the car around and headed back to the safety of the cottage. There was no hot spring. There was no way that creepy building in the woods could have ever been a hot spring either. I cannot forget that event. And we often talk about it when we meet up. Perhaps we were summoned or called by something in that abandoned building. Oh, it sounds like it's starting to rain, everybody. We better go inside. This happened about three years ago, when I started living alone. I was eager to move out from my parents' house and stand on my own two feet. I saved up for a long time, and I was finally able to move out and into the city to start my life. I was really excited. Of course, I couldn't afford much, so I was constantly in search of cheap apartments. I'm not sure if you know about this, but in Japan there are so-called homes with histories. And that basically means some sort of fatal accident or crime happened within those walls. These properties are always the cheapest to rent, as most people don't want to live somewhere that they think is haunted. It's also generally established that the real estate agents must disclose the history of the property before anyone signs on the dotted line. 
Back in those days, I didn't really care about living in a property with a bit of history. I just wanted to live in the middle of the city, so I didn't hesitate. I knew a good deal when I saw one, and I rented one of those places, and I moved in as soon as I could. I used all the money I saved up to buy furniture and appliances. I also used some cash to decorate the apartment. I had it repainted. I made my new apartment my ideal apartment. I was so pleased with the way it turned out. The flooring was this lovely yellow and white pattern so I didn't get new flooring put in. It was just such a perfect looking place. There was one bad point though. A huge dark stain in the center of the living room. I could imagine how that stain got there. No matter how many times I tried, I just couldn't get rid of it. At first, I didn't care about it. But after a week or so, I didn't like looking at it, so I bought a rug to cover it. Things were great after that. Well, at least for a while. One day I got home from work and went to the fridge to get a beer, but the fridge wasn't working. At first I thought my new fridge was broken, and I really didn't need that. I checked the plug, I did my standard test for any appliance, turn it off and turn it on again. When that didn't work, I unplugged it, then I plugged it back in and I was relieved to hear the hum of electricity and feel the cold air start to flow. That was good news. I couldn't afford a new fridge. I took a mildly cold beer out of the fridge, drank it, then decided to take a bath. I went to draw my bath, but no hot water came out. So much for a home with a history, this was more like a defective home that the real estate company had duped me with. I was really angry. As the days went by, other strange things happened. The gas wouldn't light now and then, for the fire, and sometimes the electric went out altogether. I started to wonder if my apartment really was haunted. A week or so later, I had a day off work and I planned on gaming all day and all night. I woke up in the morning and went to grab some breakfast, and I noticed a really weird smell. It smelled like fish and blood. It was really weird. It seemed to be coming from the living room. I didn't have any fish in the fridge, so I was completely puzzled. I tried to find the source of the odor, but I came up with nothing. I had no choice but to literally douse my entire apartment in Febreze. With the smell at bay, it was time to game. I played for so long I didn't even realize it was night when I glanced at my watch. I was hungry and I needed to go shopping, so I got up and headed to the door. This is the point where I'm going to have to briefly explain the floor plan of my apartment. When you open the front door, there's a long corridor, and if you don't put the lights on, then it's pretty much pitch black during the day, and especially at night. There's a toilet room on the right, and a bathroom just beyond that, again on the right. And then after that, there's the door which leads to the living room area of my studio apartment. It's just the one room separated by a partition, and I have a really small balcony outside some sliding doors on the innermost side. So, there I went, to go get my shopping for dinner. I headed out of the lounge door, and into the long hallway. It was dark as always, but something was different. Something was in that hallway with me. Something was in the dark, there, in my apartment. Because it was so dim, I couldn't make out much, but... There was something there. It was too dark to make out the figure of it, so I couldn't tell if it was a person or not. I just froze in place and my heart began to race. I felt as if I could do nothing more than just stand there. I've never felt so helpless in my life. I felt the steady stream of air from the air conditioner blow against the sweat on the back of my neck. I was desperately considering my next move. I was thinking of turning the light on, and then I heard a massive thud. It sounded as if someone had pounded their fist against the wall or the door at the end of the corridor. My hand flew to the light switch and flipped it on instinctively. There was nothing there, nothing in my hallway when I knew that there was something there only moments ago. However, I could smell that horrible bloody fish smell again the second the lights were back on. I have no way of knowing if this was completely imagined in my mind or if I had just had an encounter with something supernatural, but I know one thing. No matter how many times I tried, I couldn't get used to the dark again in that apartment.
and believe me, I tried. But when the lights would suddenly go off, or I could smell that dreadful smell, I knew that living there was impossible. I knew that I was never alone in that place. I called the real estate agent and told them that I would be moving out. Nowadays, I don't mess with homes with histories and I live a lot easier. But sometimes when it's dark and I approach a dimly lit hallway, I feel as if something is lurking in that darkness, peering at me, watching me. So, I leave the lights on where possible. When I was in elementary school, I heard many urban legends, Kuchisake Ona, the slipmouth woman, and many stories about cryptids and yokai. I think children these days still whisper tales of these legends in hushed circles. Well, I think that there's always truth in rumors. Each town and each school has their own urban legends, right? Well, I want to tell you about the urban legend, which turned out to be not so much of an urban legend, that ran rampant in my neighborhood. I haven't seen anyone mentioning this one online. Have you ever heard of Ayamare-san? When walking home from school, if you're walking alone, you would hear someone suddenly shout, Ayamare, Ayamare, to you. So in Japanese, Ayamare means say you're sorry. So this person was called Ayamare-san because that's all that she would ever say. She would chase kids after school and scream at them to apologize. No one ever knew what she was expecting them to apologize for. It became such an issue in our neighborhood that there were bulletins and meetings about this woman. Ayamare-san was an old lady who supposedly lived in the area. It is said that she was possessed by some sort of spirit or demon. Others claim that she was a witch or an escaped mental patient. The rumors became so prevalent. It was almost all we spoke about at school. As I remember, the first encounter I heard about Ayamare-san was told by an elementary school kid. Then after a while, even high school kids were having run-ins with her. Two brothers said that they had seen her. Apparently she turned up while they were home alone after school one day. They said that she rang the doorbell, spoke in a quiet voice, and said, Excuse me. With the boys believing it was safe to come to the door, they replied with a hello. They said that they thought it was a neighbor but they were wrong. For the second they replied, the door thundered with the banging of fists. What soon followed were the terrifying shrieks of Ayamare-san, demanding them to apologize again and again. The boys were terrified and stood shivering in the hall as the shadow of Ayamare-san loomed behind the frosted glass. The most chilling point was the fact that none of the neighbors came to their aid they had no doubt that the neighbors had heard the banging and screaming. There were other rumors about her. Apparently she could appear in your dreams, and on nights where the moon was full and the neighborhood was silent, you could wake from those nightmares to hear her screaming for your apologies in the dead of night. No one seemed to know who this woman was or where she came from, but just as quickly as she came into our lives, she disappeared. Rumors about her died down. Perhaps everyone got carried away with the stories about her. She seemed to only appear to those who were terrified of seeing her. Someone said that someone did apologize to her and that's why she went away. But that could have been just a coincidence. No one could ever track down the person who apologized to her, so we just couldn't confirm it. I believe that she wasn't gone. And I was right, because I met her once. It was when I was leaving school one afternoon in October. I would try to describe her as best I can. She had very thin, beady eyes with an insane grin on her face. Her face was close to bright red and she was fairly old. Her hair was all over the place and unkempt. On my first glance, I knew that she was a strange person. I was approaching her and the second I was about to pass her, she screamed at me in a voice which didn't sound human. She demanded apologies just like the legend dictated. She screamed over and over. It was truly disturbing. After she'd yelled for a while, she seemed satisfied and then just wandered off. I've heard that some families moved out of our town because of the impact this had on their children. Well, 
All the people I know who have had encounters with Ayamare-san have met her after someone has told them about her. Who knows, maybe that's the way she gets into your life by simply hearing someone speak about her. When I went back to my hometown last year, something really weird happened. It started when the neighbor across the street warned me that there was a suspicious person in the area. Apparently, someone was going around ringing people's doorbells at about 1am in the neighborhood. My neighbor said that they ignored the doorbell at first, since they were in bed and it was so late. Everyone in their house was still in bed asleep and they weren't really expecting guests at that time of night. The doorbell kept ringing so my neighbor's husband got out of the bed to see what was going on. He took his phone with him so his wife could listen. He asked through the door in a quiet voice, Who is it? Is there some sort of emergency? Then a man's voice responded, ah, I'm looking for Sarah. Can you let me in? There was no Sarah in the house or in my neighbor's family for that matter. And because it was a newly built house, there was no former resident called Sara either. So he explained this to the stranger at the door and told him to get lost. But, um, I made a promise to her. I, I remember it well. The stranger said, Well, I have a promise for you to remember well. If you don't go away, I'm calling the cops, okay? The neighbor's husband called the cops anyway, because the guy outside didn't show any signs of leaving. The police arrived and the man at the door was nowhere to be seen, so the neighbor warned us to be careful, just in case he came back. We spoke about it at dinner that night, and I remember my parents were going around the house making sure that everything was locked when the sun went down. Later that night, my dad and I were in the living room watching TV. It was just after midnight. The doorbell rang. Before assuming that it was that weirdo who called at my neighbor's house, I actually went and checked. We didn't have a way to check outside like those doorbells nowadays, so I crept over to the curtains. I pulled the curtain back just enough to create a gap to look outside. Through the gap in the curtains, I saw a man wearing a hat and a big dark brown overcoat. He was also wearing boots as well. His face was hidden by the turned up collar of his overcoat. I couldn't really see his face. I watched as he pushed the doorbell again. My dad whispered to me to not get caught looking at the guy, so I immediately shut the curtain. This guy was definitely suspicious. There was no doubt. I mean, you wouldn't want to see him at your door, let me put it that way. We decided to call the police since the neighbors were already worried about the guy, but until the police arrived, we thought we would keep him busy since last time he bolted. For about three straight minutes, he rang our doorbell. He was so persistent. My dad had had enough of this, so he went out into the hallway and approached the door. He stood before the frosted glass and asked, Who are you? I'm the guy who promised to meet Sarah. What's your name? Ah, well. Is this an emergency? Well, I'm here for Sarah. I really want to come in. The guy just talked in circles. Of course, there was no Sara in our house either. If you told him that, though, he would just keep talking about his promise and how he remembered a promise and how he was here to meet her. It got you nowhere. While this was going on, I called the police discreetly. I wanted to see this guy get taken away, but he left before the police car arrived. We then heard knocking at the door. Police, the officer said. We have a door in front of the actual front door to our house, you know, like a porch. I was amazed to hear the knocking from the officer on the actual front door, not the porch door. When the weird guy was at our door, I was certain that the porch door was shut and I didn't hear it open and close when he left. This door can only be opened and locked from the inside. How the hell was that possible, I wondered. It creeped me out, but my dad didn't seem to care all that much. He calmly explained the situation to the officer. He gave a really accurate description of the guy and informed the cops that this happened in the neighborhood last night. The officer said that he hadn't seen anyone suspicious in the area. This guy knew how to get away, and he knew how to get away fast. 
However, we did find footprints in the snow. So the cop said he would follow them to see if he could find anything. He promised that there would be an increase in patrols and he asked us to report back to him instantly if the guy came back. He cautioned us, said to try and avoid going out alone at night and to double and triple check the doors are locked. This cop wasn't a new guy. He was older than my dad and something about this situation had him spooked. And that made me very nervous. There was something very sinister about this guy looking for Sarah. My mother watched the whole thing. She was sat on the stairs. I turned to her and asked if she definitely locked the outside door. You know that porch door I mentioned before. And she was adamant that she did. My dad could sense our nerves. He tried to laugh it off. <laughs> Don't worry guys. Look, I I'm sorry we couldn't get him this time. After we all confirmed and were happy that the doors were locked, we went to bed. I couldn't sleep much that night. I was relieved to see a police car patrolling the area at around 3am from my window though. The next day we heard that someone else in the neighborhood's doorbell rang. My dad was really angry at the police. He said that they must not be doing their jobs right if they hadn't caught the guy yet. Four more days had passed, where others in the area reported late night doorbell rings. Everyone said the same thing. A stranger came to their door, asking for Sarah and asking to come in. He wasn't caught. The thing I find the weirdest about this is, not one person, myself and my family included, were able to describe what that man's face looked like. That stranger was the stuff of nightmares. I spent New Year's with my family and left to go back home, worried for them. About a week later, I called my mum to check in on her, and I got an update on the situation. The house across the street from us found a note in their mailbox that read, Sarah's not here, but I found her. Thank you very much. The letters were painted by a brush, like calligraphy. I'm wondering if we'll get a thank you letter too, or what it means if we don't get one. I'm sorry it sounds like a mundane story, but imagine if it happened to you. A stranger whose face no one saw in the neighborhood going around in the dead of night and trying to talk their way into your home. I don't like it. I don't like that he found Sarah either. This happened in the summer of 1986, or maybe 1987. Some friends and I wanted to go climb Mount Tanigawa. And how you would do that back in the day would be to take the train from Ueno to Echigozawa. If you set off at around 11, then you could be at Doai Station for about midnight. Now this station was an interesting one. Not only was it a great place to begin the hike up the mountain, but there was no bullet train around this time, and no resort like there is now. It's now called Gala Yuzawa. Back then the rules were a little more relaxed and there were ways to bend the rules in your favor. Let's say if you boarded the train at the point that I did, that you wouldn't have to show your ticket to anyone or even buy a ticket. Doai station was an unmanned station so it really was an easy place for people to get off without having their tickets checked. So all anyone had to do was just bolt down the stairs. I heard from some friends that the only time attendees turned up was to check the tickets when a train arrived not departed. And that really wasn't that often. I was there with two friends, two fellow mountain climbers. I will refer to them as T and H. Since we were students and we weren't rich, we thought that if we spent the night at the unmanned station, we would save some money and avoid some train fares. We watched all the other commuters, mainly hikers, disappear. We had a plan to get up early and be on the first train out before the ticket checkers would be there. The plan was foolproof, right? The train we needed would depart from the underground. It was incredibly cool down there, even though it was summer. We could hear random drips echoing from the tunnel the train passes through. There was a small waiting room by the station platform. It was nice and bright in there, so at least we had a light source. We decided to head in there and take a nap since we had gotten a little cold. 
we dragged all of our luggage in there and hunkered down for the night. Several freight trains passed through in the middle of the night. I remember waking up as they roared by and wondered where I was each time. I hate that feeling. I was mildly annoyed that I seemed to be the only one who woke up each time. I can't remember what time in the night it was, but I woke up again to hear the sound of footsteps echoing around the empty platform. I focused on the sound and tried to pinpoint the location of the footsteps, and they sounded as if they were approaching the waiting room. Someone's coming, but who? I wondered. I decided to lie still just in case it was a member of staff or another hiker looking for a chat or something to borrow. The footsteps stopped outside the waiting room. At this point, I imagined that whoever was out there was another person looking for a place to sleep for the night. Awkward seconds tumbled into minutes. I couldn't hear any further footsteps. How long will they wait outside? I didn't get a hint or a sign that this person was about to enter the waiting room. It was annoying, so I popped my head up and looked towards the entrance. There was no one there. My spine froze. The whole waiting room seemed to have grown cold in the blink of an eye. Did I mishear those footsteps? Did I imagine them? I didn't mind which option just as long as I was able to convince myself of one. I started to sweat. Time trickled by without incident. I thought about changing my shirt since I felt gross, but I couldn't be bothered as I was so tired. I ended up falling asleep. A while later, I awoke again. This time, I could hear a man's voice speaking in a low tone, mumbling or muttering. This was dovetailed with his heavy breathing. I opened my eyes wide. I couldn't make out the words the voice was whispering at first. After a while, I made out words such as, please, and let me. It sounded as if he was asking for someone or something. His voice had an undercurrent of sorrow to it, like he was in pain. I wondered if it was someone outside the waiting room who couldn't get in. So again, I sat up and looked towards the entrance and I couldn't see anyone there. The fluorescent light was flickering above my head. I could still hear this mumbling, pain-stricken voice. I started to feel sick, seasick, like the room was spinning. Is this a dream? I wondered, or perhaps hoped. Maybe it was my imagination, since I hadn't been sleeping much on this trip. My friend, H, started twitching in his sleep. I started to worry about him. So I shook him awake. He woke up and inhaled and exhaled deeply. Oh, sleep paralysis, I am so glad you woke me. I don't want to go to sleep again. Oh, are you staying awake? He looked petrified. There shouldn't be anyone else down here but us this time of night. Or was it early morning? It was far too early for a member of staff to be here. We woke up T and decided as a group to head to the overground section of the station. We didn't want to be underground anymore. We grabbed all our heavy hiking gear and turned towards the 500 or so stone steps, sighed, and started to climb them. Without any gear, it takes about 20 minutes to climb these stairs. Just as a side note, T told us before that there was a rumor that if you counted the steps on the way down, then you would meet an accident climbing Mount Tanigawa. As we climbed back up the stairs, not counting them, of course, we felt hot air being blown our way from above ground. When we finally got to the top of the stairs, we saw a few other climbers sleeping in the station. They must have had the same idea as us. I didn't know exactly what time it was, but I knew that it was one of those dark hours before dawn. We settled down close to the other climbers, and I felt a bit less tense. H pulled out his camping stove and set about boiling some water. I guess it was an early breakfast for us. We didn't have much else to do. Did you guys sleep alright last night? H asked. He then proceeded to tell us that he had a disturbing and frightening dream in the underground. He said that he thought he heard the sound of someone walking towards where we were sleeping. In his dream, he said he saw someone peering at us with a look of such unspeakable terror on their face. It was a man. He couldn't remember what he was wearing, but he was certain that the man was staring at us. 
When he met the eyes of the man looking in on us, he said that he had never seen a face so desperate. He said that the dream troubled him so much because he was unable to help or understand the reason behind that man's glare. He recognized it as desperation and utter horror. This was really out of character for H. He was older than us and I had never known him to lie. He never bragged or tried to pull pranks either. This is why I got such chills when he recounted a similar story to what happened to me without me telling him what had happened. We were silent while we ate breakfast for a while. I didn't want to talk anymore. I was exhausted and still shaken up. H then said while eating, Many people go missing in this area. I bet a lot of them meet with foul play. With that, we all stayed silent, and we fell asleep as the sun was rising in front of the ticket gate. We were all severely lacking in sleep. We woke up when the station started to get a little busier. This was the first time in this station I didn't mind getting awoken. We were happy to get the hell out of there. I could understand if it was just my experience, but the fact that H had the same experience as me, that is something that's always frightened me. This happened when I was little. I think I was in the second grade of elementary school at the time. My mother died when I was very young, so I was raised by my father. I guess that growing up in a household like that made me kind of introverted. When I was in the first year of elementary school, I was bullied relentlessly. So much so that I refused to go to school. If I was at school, I would do everything I could to try to escape. I hated it. My behavior was bad enough to get me sent to live with my mother's side of the family, way out in the countryside. I was living with my grandparents. I really hated the countryside. It was hard to believe that such a place so boring could even exist in the modern world. I felt like it was from another time period. Like, there weren't many kids my age in the area. I think there were only a couple of high school students. It was alright though, since I already got used to my own company. I loved insects back then. I would just go out and go bug catching. I guess that was one good point of living in the countryside. There was an abundance of bugs to hunt for. I guess I spent about half a year in the countryside living like this, and then things changed when I met a woman. She was probably in her late twenties or early thirties. She had long dark hair, and she was beautiful. Hey, are you on holiday or something? I don't think I've seen you here before, she said. I was kind of shocked because I didn't expect her to speak to me. I noticed that she was gazing at my little plastic insect collecting cage. Whoa, you got so many, can I take a look? She called out to me. Well, at that age, talking about insects was pretty much my favorite topic, so I couldn't believe my luck when she said that. I really enjoyed telling her everything I knew about the bugs that I had. She was really complimentary and was hanging on my every word. I had never had another person outside of my family praise me like that before. It was just the best feeling ever. So, from that day forward, I wanted to see her all the time and talk with her about bugs and stuff. She wanted to spend time with me too. We were looking for bugs in a field and even a river. It was great. We would always agree to meet by a stone Jizo monument near the river. I would often speak to my grandfather about her and he always said that it was someone's daughter in the village and she wouldn't be around long in to leave them alone and to not annoy them. He didn't understand that we were friends. I didn't care. It was just so great to find a friend in such a depopulated area. She was really nice, but she never spoke about herself much. Whenever I told her anything, she would be so happy to hear it. And I told her everything. How I was bullied and how I didn't have a mum, etc. Whenever I complained about something, she had a sympathetic ear. I thought of her as a mother, to be completely honest with you. I even told her that, and she looked very sad for a second, and then she smiled. Sadly, shortly after this, I got sick. 
At first I thought it was just a cold, and since I didn't have a fever or anything like that, I thought I was well enough to go out and play. I hated not being able to see her, and even when I was sick I would go down to the usual meeting place to wait for her. But as my illness got worse and worse, my grandpa noticed. I was told to rest at home, but it didn't help at all. Even when I was forced to rest in bed, I wouldn't stop asking about her. I really wanted to see her. I kept on and on about her so much that my grandpa phoned her family home to ask for her. I remember thinking that grandpa was off of the phone very quickly. He came back into my bedroom with a concerned look on his face. Hey, you. Who you been playing with because it sure ain't the woman I thought. She didn't come back this summer. Do you even know the name of the woman you've been going around with? What kind of person have you been seeing? I really panicked. I hated being cornered and told off. I couldn't think straight. I couldn't remember her name. And in fact, we didn't even ask each other our names. We had so many other fun things to talk about. Well, Grandpa couldn't believe that, and he demanded to know what she looked like, so I did my best to describe her appearance. Once I did, Grandpa stormed out of the room and back towards the phone. I wondered what the hell the problem was, but now I'm older, I realize why he was concerned. We lived way out in the middle of nowhere, and we didn't really get too many strangers in town. Everyone knew one another and one another's business. By the end of the night, no one had a clue who that woman was, and I think my grandparents started to suspect that she might not have ever existed. They told me to stop going to meet her, and because I was really ill at the time and I could barely move from the bed, I had little other choice. After a while, I got a little better, and I was allowed to play outside my grandparents' house. I always kept an eye out for my friend, even though I knew I would be in so much trouble if I was seen with her. I missed her. A while passed, and I ended up playing in the back garden of my grandparents' home. And then, when I realized they weren't paying attention to where I was anymore, I went into the field behind the back garden. There was a hole in the fence, and I could sneak into the field and back out to the garden pretty easily. The field had a lot more places to search for bugs, and because I got better, I returned to bug hunting since there wasn't really that much else to do. I was engrossed in looking under the leaves of a small shrub when I heard someone call my name. It wasn't either of my grandparents. It was my friend. She was back. I was so happy that she came to go bug hunting with me. I was too overjoyed to ask her any of the things my grandpa asked me all those months ago. I was just a kid. I saw that my grandparents spotted me from the window and I waved at them and they waved back. But everything was alright again in my little world, it seemed. At dinner time I said to my grandpa, Hey, you saw us bug hunting today, right? Why didn't you come say hello to her? My grandparents stopped eating and looked at me. You were playing alone, unless she went off somewhere far and you know you're not supposed to do that but I didn't see you with no her their looks of concern didn't fade and my grandpa went to the phone again but this time to call my father he came back and uttered the most heartbreaking sentence I've ever heard look I'm really sorry but you're gonna have to go back to your dad my heart sunk so I was being sent away. I guess that's because they thought I was imagining some woman or... I really didn't know. I had about a week to think of all the reasons why I was being sent away. And during that time, I wasn't even allowed to go outside. I missed my friends so much and I hated being indoors after being sick all that time. I was really sad. I sat on the porch of my grandparents' home waiting for my dad to come and take me away. I remember just crying my eyes out and demanding to be there on that porch because I just wanted to see her one last time. And then, there she was. She appeared out of nowhere. She crouched down and spoke to me. What's the matter? Choking on the lump in my throat and fighting back the tears welling in my eyes, I told her that I had to go. Oh no, don't cry. It's a good thing. I'll be supporting you, just from a distance. I asked her if I would ever see her again, and she looked down and shook her head. My heart 
ached. It was the first friend I made in my life. The first person who ever wanted to talk to me for me being me. She waved goodbye to me with this big smile and walked on out of the garden and out of my life. After that I went home and back to school and I didn't get bullied again. I felt so much better, like a weight had been lifted. I felt like I was enjoying life for the first time. I understood the beauty of the word normal, and I felt like I could be described as it. After I went away, we didn't get to go back that often. And with age came wisdom, and I learned a few things about the area I used to play in. That particular area had been kind of infamous in the past for disappearances, especially child disappearances. Some old texts and rumors say that kids who don't make a whole lot of friends were the ones to disappear, you know, the loners. I even heard that some of the kids before they disappeared were sick for a bunch of days, for some unknown reason. But given all that, I don't care. I never saw her again, and I never knew who she was. Was she so important to me, though? <sighs> she might have been a ghost. She might have wanted to spirit me away. She might have been protecting me from being spirited away. She might have been an everyday person, as real as you or I. I don't know. It's a little scary now I'm older, and I think back on it, but when I was younger, I felt nothing but love for her. She was like the mother I never had and I always wanted. This happened a couple of dozen years ago, but I'll never forget it. Thanks for listening. This happened the other day, when I was out with some friends. We had spoken about taking a trip to an outlet mall in the next city over. It would be me, my girlfriend, and my friend and his girlfriend. We had been friends since junior high school, so it was a nice trip back down memory lane to all hang out together. I have had a driver's license since I graduated from high school, and I was going to drive. I don't have a car myself since it's more economical to use the train to commute to work. I decided to rent a car since I'm not exactly rich. I went for a cheap one. It was just an old family car which had thousands of miles on the clock. It would do, I thought. I got in the car straight away. And as soon as I did, I found it cold in there. I guessed that the guy who had brought it round must have been blasting the AC. Since I would have three other people in this rental car shortly, and it was the height of summer, I didn't care that it was a little cold. So we set off that day. It took about two hours to get there using the expressway. On the way we were chatting about old times. It was really fun. We pulled into a rest area about halfway on the trip, and when we were about to get back on the road again, something strange happened. My friend, the other guy, was sitting in the front seat on the drive up, and now he wanted to go in the back. This didn't seem like him at all. I prefer sitting back here, someone else can ride in the front, he said. The girls looked at one another, and neither of them seemed to want to ride in the front either. Things got weirder when a full-blown argument broke out about who had to ride in the front. The atmosphere really changed. It was so weird. I couldn't understand what the big deal was, but none of them were backing down. It was like being at school again. I just told them that they could all ride in the back. We took off and I tried to lighten the mood, but it was tough. We arrived at the mall and things picked up. We had lunch and we were shopping and we all forgot about it. Before we knew it, it was evening time and the sun was setting. We had decided it was time to be heading back. When we got to the parking lot, they all ran to the back doors of the car. They wanted to ride in the back again. I didn't care at this point, I just wanted to go home. Maybe we were all tired because we were pretty much silent on the drive back. It had been smooth sailing the whole way to the mall, but on the way back, I guess I must have taken a turning I shouldn't have or something because... I was now driving down more rural roads, and the number of cars on the streets had decreased. 
The weird thing was that I had been using the car's satellite navigation system, so I don't know how I ended up down these dark, quiet roads leading to the mountains. I pulled over and checked what was up with the sat-nav. The address of the rental place was in there, but I was really far away from the highway. What's wrong? My friend asked from the back seat. Navigation's all messed up, I replied. I deleted everything and put in the rental place's address again, and then we set off. After about ten minutes, the navigation asked me to turn left. I did so, and we went down this really thin lane. It literally took us deep into the woods. There were no street lights, and it was really dark. I was obviously skeptical of this. We didn't have to pass through the woods to get here, why should we have to on the way back? But since I was in a place I hadn't been before, I gave the sat-nav the benefit of the doubt and trusted it. The guys in the back were deftly silent, so at least I didn't have any protests. I headed up a slope. There was nothing but dark, dense forest surrounding us. After a little while, the paved asphalt road beneath us disappeared and we entered grassland. Now I was convinced that the sat-nav was wrong. Sorry guys, looks like I made a mistake here. I need to make a U-turn. Still, they were silent back there. I don't know why, but I didn't take off straight away. I don't know why, but I stopped the car there. And as soon as I did, everyone got out. I still don't know why I parked the car there. It was like I was supposed to. I got out of the car too. What is this place? My friend's girlfriend asked. The trees were swaying in the breeze making a kind of sighing sound. Even though it was just a bit of grassland in the woods, it felt incredibly oppressing to be there. My chest was tightening. Then the three of them started marching into the woods. Hey, what are you doing? I called out. They didn't reply and they didn't stop. I really didn't want to lose them in the woods. I ran up to them to try and stop them, but they just wouldn't stop. I didn't know what to do, but for some reason I raced back to the car and honked the horn. Then, as if they had snapped out of some kind of trance, they stopped walking. They came back to the car, got in the back seat, and I did my U-turn, and I got the hell out of there. Something was off about that place. I looked in the rear view mirror only once, but I swear, I saw someone stood behind a tree, peering out at us. After we got out of the woods, I managed to get back onto the highway. My friends were silent until this point. They seemed terrified. When we were on the highway, they told me that they had no recollection of getting out of the car and heading into the woods. We managed to get back to the rental place without any of the weird goings on. I was so tired. We were asked to check the car, to make sure we hadn't forgotten anything. I looked under the passenger seat and found a ring. It looked like a wedding ring. I asked the girls just in case, but they said it wasn't theirs. Now, this is a little out there, but this is my personal theory of what happened that night. It goes like this. Something happened to the owner of that ring in the woods that the sat-nav led us to. We were probably invited there by the owner of that ring. Now, I don't know if there are any active disappearance cases or any unsolved murders, but something doesn't seem right. We had to give the ring to the rental car place to store it in their lost and found property. When renting a car, you never know what could have happened in it before you get it. This happened when I was working as a part-time cleaner in a hospital. I would clean at about midnight, as there was less patients and doctors around. It was the working hours I was given, so I couldn't really complain. One night, after all my cleaning was done, I had put my equipment away and got in the elevator and headed for the ground floor. At that time, there were no doctors, nurses, or anyone around. It was really quiet. I couldn't hear or see any of the patients. I got in the elevator and pressed the button for the ground floor, like always, except this time, despite me pressing the button for the ground floor, 
the elevator went down to the underground floors. I continued to press the button for the ground floor, but it was no good. The elevator finally stopped at the second basement floor. It was really weird. It had never happened before. I didn't like this floor, especially not at night time because all that was down here was the post-mortem, examination rooms, and the morgue. Who was calling the elevator down here at this time of night, I wondered. I was the only night shift worker that night. Why would someone be messing with the elevator? Well, I got out of the elevator on this floor and I went to check to see if anyone had wandered down here. Then, behind me, I heard the jolting sound of the elevator doors closing, which shocked me. The elevator started heading back up. Now I was down there alone. It was going non-stop to the highest floor in the building. I couldn't understand why, as there was nothing but a storeroom and a door which accesses the roof up there. It was off limits to the patients, and only the cleaning staff like me had any business going up there. I called the elevator back to the floor I was on. It finally arrived, and the doors opened. There was no one in the elevator, but there was something wrong. I got in, and I smelled something terrible. The elevator stank of copper. I recognized that smell, and it was the smell of blood. It was inside the elevator, yet the elevator was clean. I couldn't bear being in that elevator. I had to get out and use the stairs on the floor above. I entered the stairwell, and I was certain that someone was watching me. It felt as if someone was right behind me. I ran as fast as I could up those stairs, but I couldn't escape that feeling. I felt for sure that I wasn't alone, but every time I looked back, I realized I was the only one on those stairs. I finished my shift and felt creeped out on the long walk home, but once I was home, I felt a little better. I had work the next day, and I was a little apprehensive. I saw some of my work colleagues, and they were asking me if I heard the news about last night. I said I didn't know, and asked what had happened. They said that someone had taken the elevator to the top floor and jumped. They said that the body was admitted to the morgue that night. Last night. It was shocking to hear that. I didn't really believe in anything paranormal, so I didn't make the connection to what happened the night before. I just got on with my work. The next day was a day off for me, and I invited a friend over for a few drinks. He's a pretty strange guy to some, I guess. He claims to have the second sight, you know, the ability to sense the presence of the dead. I thought that he might get a kick out of my little mysterious experience, so I told him what had happened. He listened carefully, but began to fidget. I figured he just needed the toilet, so I ignored him. Then he suddenly shot to his feet, saying, I'm leaving. I asked him what the problem was. I said I had loads more booze and I needed his help to drink it all. He couldn't be convinced to stay there. I was annoyed at him, and instead of staying up and drinking alone, I decided to go to bed. I had a terrible nightmare that night. I was being forced into this small and confined area. Cold steel metal was all around me, and it was just so horrible. The next day, I asked my friend what the problem was and why he left so abruptly. Get this, it gets really weird from here on, just letting you know. He said that while I was talking, for some reason he looked over towards my door and saw a woman peering at us through the gap in the letterbox. You know, the mail slot. Well, we all know that there is no way someone can fit their head through a mail slot, right? Well, you'd have to have a really flat or mashed up head, I guess. That thought lingered in my mind and made me feel quite sick. I didn't like looking at the mail slot after that. Could that poor person who jumped, spirit, follow me home from the morgue to my home and watch me through the mail slot? It was just too impossible to believe. I hoped that my friend was just messing with me. It wasn't a funny prank if that was the case though. Well, I ended up moving away shortly after to get a better job and things got better after that. It's a weird little tale I wanted to share. Thanks for listening. This is an urban legend I heard from a friend. 
which is apparently true, so if you don't want to mess around with stuff like this, then please just ignore it. My friend A was studying for an exam one snowy night in January. A was in his third year of high school at the time. As the hour grew late, he heard a knocking sound coming from outside his bedroom window. It knocked three times. For some reason, A knocked on the window three times in response, since he was sat at arm's reach of the window. A's bedroom was on the second floor, and there was no balcony outside his window. There should be no one out there on such a cold and snowy night anyway. A didn't have this in his mind though. He was concentrating on studying, so he didn't really question anything. Then a little later, a story he had heard from his friend suddenly jumped to the forefront of his mind, and the story goes like this. It comes when you're alone, when you're completely alone. It's always behind a window or a door where no human can be, behind a window of a fourth floor building, behind a bathroom door of a person living alone, even coming from inside the refrigerator. It knocks three times, always three times. Those who hear the knocking aren't frightened when they hear it. Nobody knows why they aren't frightened when they hear it, but this is important for later. Once you hear that knocking sound, you need to reply with the same number of knocks. If you fail to do so, that night, you may fall asleep and never wake up. Or, more likely, someone you know will be subjected to terrible misery. Or worse, death. That person is usually the person you deem most important in your life. All you have to do is knock back the same number of knocks you hear, okay? Keep that in mind. He wasn't frightened the moment he heard the mysterious knocking sound, and he knew he wasn't imagining it. He heard three knocks. But the knocking came for his friend, who we will call G. G didn't knock back. He remembered the story, but he wanted to see what would happen if you didn't knock back. A few days later, G got a call from a relative. His grandfather passed away. I heard this all from my friend, and man, G sounds like an idiot, right? From now on, this is my personal experience. Well, I first heard the story when I met A at university. We were out drinking and telling ghost stories. After I heard about two or three of these spooky stories, including this knocking one, I went back to my room since I was tired. Since I was at university, there was the normal amount of noise from the others in the same dorm as me. I wasn't in the same room, but the noise of the others down the hall was keeping me awake, and I was really tired. After a while, I heard a knocking sound coming from inside the wardrobe. I thought because of the story that A had told me one of his friends, if not the man himself, was hiding in that wardrobe and knocking to scare me. So I ran over to the wardrobe, I opened it as fast as I could, and there before me, I saw one of A's friends with a dumb smile on his face. I love pranks, so I wasn't even angry. So up to this point, it's just a funny story, right? I heard the knocking sound a day later, when I went home to visit my parents. As you might expect, it came from a place where no one had the right to be. I heard it as I was drying myself after I got out of the shower. The knocking came from inside the shower against the glass door. I instantly copied the amount of knocks back. It was three for me, just like it was for A. I wasn't scared when I heard the knocking. Of course, when I told my friends about this, they just laughed at me. But honestly, please heed my warning. If you hear the knocking, you have to knock back. Five of the people I have told this story to have heard the phantom knocking. Don't forget to knock back. I want to share with you an experience I had in an apartment I lived in about two years ago. When I was house hunting, I was looking for a place which was cheap, and I didn't mind a place that had a bit of an edge to it, you know? A real estate company was keen to show me an apartment. It was pretty small, but it had a loft, nice sun coverage too. The cool thing about the place was the vast amount of storage space that it offered due to the high ceilings, and it was in a great location. I literally had no complaints, so I went ahead and told them that I'd take the apartment right there on the spot. Man, was that a mistake. Back then I had a cat, and I'm going to be completely honest and hold my hands up here and say, 
I forgot to let them know I had a pet. In my defense, I was never asked. I felt guilty about it, but I didn't want to lose this great new place or give up my cat. It was tough. I thought for all parties involved, it might just be best for me to keep my mouth shut and see if anyone noticed. After meeting some of the residents and introducing myself, I went to take a look around the area to see what was available. I wanted to acclimate myself and find my go-to stores. I liked the neighbors. They were welcoming. After all the moving in was done, I was exhausted. So that night, I didn't unpack anything but the bare essentials. My cat was acting pretty weird. She was by the front door and hissing occasionally. I put this down to her being in a new place so I didn't pay it much mind. But then my cat did this kind of lower groaning voice. I'm sure you're familiar with the sound I'm trying to describe. And that weirded me out because she doesn't usually do that. I guessed that there might be another cat in the area or something like that. So I tried to ignore it and get some sleep. I went to sleep pretty quickly due to the move. My cat wouldn't stop this low growling night after night. So one night I tiptoed over to her and tried to figure out what was upsetting her. I knew that there was something on the other side of that door. I'm not talking about something supernatural. I'm talking about a human. You know when you see the shadowy outline of feet in the gap beneath the door? Yeah, that's what I saw that night. I really wanted to throw the door open and confront whoever was out there, but the risks were too great, and I didn't feel safe. Whoever was out there wasn't a normal person. Who stands in front of someone's door in the dead of night? Who does that? I was really terrified. I was living alone as a young female, and someone was out there for reasons unknown to me. The only thing I could do was head back to my bedroom with my cat and hide out till the morning. My cat kept on growling, and I barely slept that night. From then on, sleep was hard to come by, so I wanted to get out of that apartment. But I was locked into a long-term deal that I couldn't get out of without losing a load of money. I didn't have any family to turn to either. I knew that I would be able to move in three months, so I just held on to that. I was so stressed out by the situation, I went to see a doctor, and he told me that I was suffering from stress. I had lost weight too. I stayed with a friend for a couple of days until I was a burden, and then I went back to my apartment. I decided to show my face around in the apartment complex more, in the hope that I would get along better with my neighbors. Also, I wanted them to know that I was okay just in case they were worrying about me. I said hello as I bumped into them, and I was shocked to realize that every single one of them ended up in one way or another talking about my cat or cats in general. Let me give you a couple of examples. Oh, you know cats aren't allowed in this building, right? It's crazy, right? Well, I just thought that you should know. I wouldn't dream of bringing a pet in here without the landlord's approval. I'm sure you feel the same. Ah, oh, this is funny. Did you know that the landlord hates cats? <laughs> I couldn't believe it at first. Did you know that? I never took my cat out of my room. She's an indoor cat. How on earth did they know? It's not like she was causing any trouble either. I'm a proud cat owner and I really took care of her. I was sick of these not so subtle comments. So when the next person asked me, I replied, how did you know I have a cat? I thought that they were going to feign ignorance, but my neighbor's reply shocked me. Because we all took turns watching. This is where the story gets absolutely mad. Apparently the landlord ordered the other residents to keep an eye on me. My neighbor said that the second I returned home from work, someone was ordered to keep watch. The creepiest thing about this was the fact that she wasn't even embarrassed or found it strange that she was ordered to do this. She proudly and smugly said to me that she found my cat when she lifted up the mail slot to look inside my apartment. I argued back that this was a complete invasion of my privacy and it was all totally insane. All of my arguments were met with the same reply. We were only doing what the landlord told us. It was a total regime and deeply disturbing this landlord had them all brainwashed. Since this neighbor of mine was content to tell me everything, I asked more and more, and her smug smile widened each time she knew it was getting to me. 
The landlord even told them to go through my mail to find out more about me. When I heard that, I decided that enough was enough. I called the real estate company immediately and told them I was leaving, and thankfully, they were sympathetic. I didn't lose any money. I now knew why such a great place and a great location was so cheap. I guess I can laugh about it now and it's a story to tell, but I still find it deeply disturbing. Nowadays I'm in a better place, no weirdos outside, no issues with pets, and no insane landlord. Sometimes a good place is worth the price, and if something is too good to be true, it usually is because it isn't. When I was 20, I started living alone in Tokyo. I was a student, and every day seemed busier than the last. I was working a part-time job just to stay afloat. I barely had enough money to make ends meet. I looked for somewhere new to live. I wanted and needed somewhere cheaper. Rent in Tokyo is always going to be insanely expensive, so I thought that I'd have little other choice than to move out to a rural area outside of the city and start looking for a bus or a train route. Just as I was about to throw in the towel, I found a property in the city that I could actually afford. The icing on the cake was that it was a newly built female-only apartment. It was too good to pass up. The building was built the year prior, therefore everything was new. I was so satisfied. I moved in, and I spent the whole day cleaning and unpacking my things. I wanted everything to be perfect. I was exhausted by the time night came. I fell asleep on the bed, and after what seemed like only a few hours, I suddenly woke up. It took me a second to figure out where I was because I wasn't used to my new place. I wondered what time it was, so I tried to sit up and look towards the clock on the wall, but I couldn't move. I realized that I was in some sort of state of sleep paralysis. My eyes were open, but my body was sapped of all of its strength. It was a terrifying thing. I couldn't do anything except stare at the ceiling. I heard a moaning sound. I thought that it was just some dream at first, yet the sound persisted. It was clear that the moaning sound wasn't imaginary. I could hear it in the room with me. I was scared, deep down scared, more scared than I'd ever been in my life. I was sweating, yet cold at the same time. I tried to summon the energy to leave my bed, but I couldn't. My body remained stationary. The voice, that moaning sound, was so disturbing it seemed neither to be a male or female. Just a voice of suffering. THE voice of suffering. I don't know what happened. I woke up, and it was morning. I suddenly realized that I couldn't hear the moaning anymore. I had never had a paranormal experience in my life before and I never believed in ghosts until that night. I am now convinced of their existence. But that wasn't the last of my experiences with sleep paralysis. It wasn't every day. But now and then, when sleep paralysis came for me, I would always hear the voice of suffering. I kept living there. I couldn't afford anything else. I spoke to a friend on the phone about my experience, and I expected to be laughed at, but... She was quite understanding, and helped me to try and figure the whole thing out. Anyway, during our conversation, she said something that struck me. It's a newly built apartment. How is that an accident property? I didn't know the answer to that question. And I certainly wasn't warned by the realtor when I was signing the papers. I thought that I should try and find out what used to be there before the apartments were built. And what I found shocked me. Before the apartments were built, there was a parking lot for several years, and before that, there was a hospice that specialized in end-of-life care. The hospice lost its funding and was demolished when an internal scandal was discovered. The patients were apparently, quickly, and forcefully evicted. Some of them without the money or family to return to, leaving them homeless with no care. I'm sure that many of the patients had nowhere to go after this, so they may have stayed within the area, because it's all they knew. 
After learning about this, I was moved, and thankfully, I didn't suffer from sleep paralysis again, but on occasion I heard that voice, that dreadful lost moaning sound, that voice of suffering. I still think that there are more facts to be discovered about this place. I would like to know more about that scandal too. There is a certain sadness which seems to linger around the building. I haven't had the courage to ask the neighbours if they experienced what I had, but their faces sometimes say more than words could. I visit rural areas for work, and therefore sometimes get home incredibly late, or I have to stay overnight at a hotel. One of those times that I had to stay away for work, I happened to be idly chatting with a friend, and he asked me where I was staying. When I mentioned the name of the hotel, he said, No way, man, not that hotel. This was nothing new, he knew I scared easy, but loved a scary story so I thought he was just playing with me. So I called him an idiot and told him to shut up. I told him not to tell me anything, otherwise I wouldn't sleep. Thankfully, I was only there for just the one night, so I thought I'd get an early night and leave early in the morning. But fear had settled in my mind. I was suspicious of everything in the hotel. I knew that I would be listening to every little noise and my mind would torture me with images from horror films before I even got into bed. Once she gets spooked, it's game over, right? I was really restless that night. I'm a pretty light sleeper and it usually takes me a while to get to sleep, so it wasn't too unusual to be sleepless. However, for some reason, I kept thinking about death. I was strangely terrified that I was about to die. I became increasingly worried and frightened about my death. It was the strangest thing. It was like I had a one-track mind, and I couldn't think of anything else but death. I was lying in bed, praying for someone to come and save me. That was how close I felt that death was to me. I didn't think I would be able to sleep, so I got up with the intention of going down to the bar, nailing some beers, to take my mind elsewhere. But then I heard several thuds at the hotel door. Someone was hammering on the door. I was so surprised it felt like my heart stopped for a second. What the hell was this? My mind searched for an explanation. Was there a fire? Some accident which meant that we all had to vacate the hotel? Did somebody know I was here? Who or what was behind that door? I hit the lights, but I was not going anywhere near that door. I just called out in a shaky voice. What is it? Then the banging suddenly stopped. I stood there stock still, like a statue. I didn't understand what was happening. Sleep seemed nothing more than a cruel joke to me now. I got up, got dressed, gathered my things, and sat there, waiting for the unknown. The silence of the hotel room was shattered again by that terrifying banging sound. What the hell is going on? I called out, but no response came. Had there been an emergency, I was certain a member of the hotel staff would have said something by now. They could unlock the door, or even call my cell phone, or the hotel room phone. I was sure that there wasn't a hotel employee out there. Why was someone just banging on the door and not saying anything? Why were they dragging it out? It was beyond disturbing. The banging didn't cease, and now the handle was rattling. Someone was trying to get in. I couldn't believe it. I wanted to call the front desk, but I just couldn't find the courage to do it. It was the weirdest feeling. It was as if I was incredibly anxious. I have never felt so helpless. I didn't know what to do, so I just backed myself into the corner of the room, on the bed, and just stared at the door, wide-eyed in terror. I prayed for the sun to come up. I started to wonder if this was a prank, you know, maybe I was on TV. It was the only answer I would be satisfied with that didn't terrify me. The prank didn't seem to end and I knew in my heart that this wasn't some joke. Maybe there was someone crazy in the building. 
The intervals between the bouts of banging and door trying grew longer and longer until the noises disappeared completely. It was over. Morning was here. I called the front desk and informed them that I was checking out. Everything was pretty much normal after that. When I spoke with my friend, the one that I had called before, the one who knew about the hotel, I was shocked when he told me what he knew. Oh yeah, your hotel? I guess you want to know now. They say that there was a fire. Not a big one, but there was one casualty. It happened a few years ago. One person couldn't get out of their hotel room. Some reviews online say it's haunted. Did they say they heard banging on the door? Oh, you know the story then? Yeah, you could say that. And then I told him all about that night. The fear of that night hasn't gone away fully yet. It's something I think about often. I asked my friend about the stories he read because I couldn't find them anywhere. According to him, apparently the guest in that hotel room couldn't get out. They couldn't get out of their room. Either the lock was broken or something else happened, it's unclear. So I said to my friend, Well, I'm really glad I didn't open that door then. I wasn't ready for his reply. Why would someone bang on the outside of the door if they couldn't get out? Are you sure the banging wasn't coming from inside the room? This happened a few years ago, in my local cinema. I always loved going to the movies. I often went after work by myself. One day I was passing, and I saw that a film was showing that I had planned on watching on the weekend. I decided to catch a late night showing alone. My local cinema is located in front of a train station, which I use regularly. And it's part of a big shopping centre too. Weekday nights are very quiet, and sometimes you find yourself being the only one in the theatre. It's perfect. I was catching the final showing of the night, and that cinema was basically empty. There was only about four or five other spectators in the 200-seat theatre. After the trailers had finished, the house lights went down, and the cinema was dark. As soon as it was dark, someone came over and sat down next to me. It was a man in his forties. He sat in the seat on my immediate left. This was so weird because the cinema was basically empty. I didn't understand why he did this. Why would someone sit next to someone else when there are so many other seats available? And then I thought that it was perhaps his favorite place to sit or his usual spot. Still weird that he came and sat next to me. I mean, I can put up with someone sitting next to me if it's crowded, but, but not when there are only a handful of other people in the cinema. Stranger still, you have to pick your seat when you buy your ticket. So he must have known he would have been sitting next to someone. I decided to move. I grabbed my handbag and headed two rows behind, and more into the middle of the row. The film went on and it wasn't that interesting, or maybe I was a little distracted. But towards the end, the tension was building for an exciting payoff. It was at this point I heard breathing behind me. There shouldn't have been anyone behind me. I tried my best to subtly check behind without fully turning around. I couldn't believe it. The guy who had sat next to me was now behind me. Why? What was the point of all this? I couldn't make sense out of it, and to be perfectly honest, the man was beginning to creep me out. I'm not really a fan of the dark, and or strangers sitting behind me. Anything could happen. My mind tormented me with the terrifying possibilities. What if he stuck a knife through the back of my seat? Maybe because the scene I was watching was a tense one, that's why I began to imagine those horrible scenarios. I don't know. The man was acting strange. I was on edge. It was creepy. Even though the film was getting really good, I decided to move again. I decided I would sit kind of close to the exit. I would get a seat with nothing but the wall behind me. 
so I could finally relax and watch the end of the film. One problem though, when I stood up, I noticed that the man wasn't sitting behind me anymore. Where the hell did you go? I wondered. Probably to go and annoy someone else. I didn't care, I just approached the seat near the exit. As I got closer, chills raced up my spine. There he was, slumped in the chair, just in front of the one I wanted to sit in. He stared at me and grinned. He knew exactly what he was doing. He knew he was scaring me, and he liked it. That was the final straw for me. I rushed out of the theater, and as soon as I walked out, I was running. Turns out that I ran too fast and I ended up hitting the floor. A member of staff asked me if I was all right. I sat in the lobby and that staff member tried to calm me down whilst I told her everything. I felt like such a fool for creating a scene. I mean, the guy in the cinema hadn't done anything apart from sit near me. Maybe I had taken it all out of context. I stuck around and waited for everyone in the screen I was in to come out to the lobby. I never saw that man come out. I find that so strange. I don't know what he had on his mind or what he might have done, but I'm certain now that he was planning something. I don't go to the cinema alone anymore. This happened about 10 years ago. Back then I was really into dating websites, before the app days, before any kind of safety was in place. I would do quite well on these apps. I matched with people who were using the dating sites for the same reason I was, if you get me. We were all looking for the same thing. I liked life. I was riding on my own confidence, daring myself to go bigger and bigger with these wild meetups. I was surprised one day to get a match with a 19 year old. Her first message said, Give me your email address. I was fine with the direct approach, so I sent it straight over. You sound fun. I want to hang out with you. I couldn't believe my luck. I smirked and said to myself, You can do that today if you want, honey. I'm in good shape. I decided to reply with, Sounds great, but why don't we exchange photos before we meet? I sent the best photo of myself I could. Slightly fraudulent, as it was a couple of years old, but hey. I bet I wasn't the only one on that site to do that. <laughs> Shortly after, I received a photo back. She was hot. I punched the air. Life was sweet. We were both really into meetings, so we set up a date. But things moved quickly. She had a pretty sweet tan and a cute pouty look on her face. I was into it. Home run. She would send emails like, Oh, I don't want to go really far. I only have a moped. Oh, it would be so great if you drove to come get me. This was kind of annoying because I wanted to avoid driving so I could drink, but since she was pretty hot, I guess I could just get loaded when I got home later. I decided to take her out to karaoke and dinner, and if there was a chance, drive somewhere secluded and, you know. The day of the date arrived, and we planned on meeting at a home improvement store's car park at 6. That's kind of weird, but okay. I got myself looking good, and I bought protection. I was sure that I was going to have a great night. I just hoped that the car would be big enough. Then my brother said he had to use our shared car. This was such a pain, as I would have to take our older, crappier van-looking car. There went my chances. I told her that I'd be in a white minivan. Then, my brother, as if he was some sort of saint, told me, that he didn't need to use the sedan anymore, and it was mine for the night. Thanks, bro. You are literally a lifesaver, I thought. The sedan was way more cooler looking and roomy. The game was back on. I had a great feeling about the night ahead. Things were going my way. I was set to arrive at the home improvement store at about five minutes ahead of the arranged meeting time. I thought I would drive around the parking lot to see if she was early too. While I was about to turn into the car park, I got an email from her saying, You here yet? I replied with, I'll be there soon. I couldn't see anyone in the car park, so I didn't really understand why she was asking me if I was here yet. Then I saw a woman about 10 meters up ahead. I actually shuddered because this seemed all wrong. 
She didn't mention anything about bringing a friend, and this was starting to look a little sinister. I saw her sat in a minivan's passenger seat, chatting to some guy in the driver's seat. I drove a little away from the van and parked up and pulled my hat down over my face. I wanted to see what would happen when I messaged her next. She got out of the minivan and spoke to someone in the car next to it. Two other men came over and spoke to her. This really sent chills up my spine. It was so crazy. What were her plans for me? Extortion? Blackmail? Was I going to get robbed? She emailed me. Well, are you close? I replied with, Ah, I got a stomach ache and I'm in the bathroom. A moment or two after I sent this message, I saw a couple of men jump out of the minivan and walk into the home improvement store. They were probably going to check the bathrooms. Where are you? She replied. I stopped off at a convenience store nearby. She must have called the men back because, in a matter of moments, they were all in the van and in the car again. They left, headed the way I came. I drove in the opposite direction as fast as I could. I sent her a message saying that I was too sick to meet up and I never heard from her again. I have learned not to give out personal information and always make sure that the meeting place is somewhere neutral with lots of people nearby. Don't bring too many personal possessions and items of ID and if something doesn't feel right, always consult the police. I had a near miss. Stay safe out there. I have two brothers, and one of my brothers seems to be a magnet for creepy and strange, unexplainable experiences. I want to share this one with you. This happened when he went over to his friend's place for a birthday party. And because it was my brother's friend's birthday, he was invited over that evening for a couple of drinks. The birthday boy was a married man and his wife and child were there celebrating the day with him. It was a pretty standard birthday, you know, cake, candles, presents, etc. And as the night progressed, the alcohol began to flow and the level of noise grew louder and the party was in full swing. Since his son likely wasn't having the greatest of fun and was hardly included in any conversations, at some point without the adults noticing, he went upstairs to presumably play in his room. My brother said he was reminiscing about old times and the two friends were laughing and just having a great time. Halfway through an anecdote, his son came rushing downstairs and interrupted him. The kid seemed frightened and was making a hell of a noise. He said that while he was playing upstairs, he heard the barking of a dog. The kid kept repeating, I can hear a dog barking upstairs. Well, apparently pets weren't allowed in the building and my brother knew that his friend didn't own a dog. He began to wonder if the child had just ruined the surprise present of a pet, but when he looked at his friend's wife's face, he knew that there was no surprise planned. We all kind of thought that the barking could have been coming from a neighbor, as he did have a neighbor upstairs. He wondered if the neighbor could have had a dog and just hidden it really well until now, but his friend's son was adamant that the barking was coming from a closet upstairs. His friend did his best to try and calm his son down, as the little boy was clearly very distressed by what he had heard up there. He intended to prove to his son that there was no dog upstairs, and it was probably just some street noise coming in through an open window. He took his son by the hand, and they began to head up the stairs. He got kind of close to the top of the stairs, and he silently turned back. He sat his son down on the sofa and whispered something to his wife. She then took the boy to another room. His sobbing had started up again. My brother's friend then said to my brother, There is barking up there, and it definitely is coming from a closet. So with extra courage provided by the alcohol in their systems, they headed upstairs and approached the room where the barking sound was coming from. It was the kids' room. As they drew closer, they realized something disturbing, something that made them stop in their tracks for a moment. Something was different. Oh, it was barking all right, but not a dog barking. It was the sound of a man doing an impression of a dog barking. 
When they got closer, the fake barking began to get more and more aggressive. They were sweating and really dreading what was beyond the closet door, but they knew they had to open it. Snarls and weird barks grew louder and louder in there. My brother counted to three on his fingers silently, and then they whipped the door open. At first they saw nothing, but then they looked down to see a middle-aged man sat down on the floor, staring at them, baring his teeth like a hound would. My brother slammed the door shut on the weirdo and got everyone downstairs and out of the house. They called the police from one of their cell phones and told them that they had an intruder in the house. He said that the police arrived in minutes. In those minutes, they watched the apartment to see if the guy would come out, and he didn't. The police headed straight upstairs and searched all over the place. They came back outside and said there was no one in the house. Naturally, locks were changed and new keys were cut, and they never saw that weirdo again, thankfully. My brother's friend said that, after that experience, he would always feel kind of sick in that house, and they just couldn't keep on living there. He wondered if what they saw was an apparition of a spirit rather than a home invader. My brother is convinced that he saw that creep in the flesh and blood. What the hell was he doing in there? It's a creepy and unique experience, I think. When I first got into high school, I got into trouble a few times, and I ended up skipping school regularly. I would stay at home and watch TV or play games. I used to take care of my younger brother a lot too. At night, I used to go out skateboarding or go over a friend's house to play more games. I probably wasn't the best babysitter. I just left him to his own devices most of the time. One evening, I was having dinner with my little bro and we were both watching TV together. I should mention that my mother was in and out of the hospital at the time. I guess that was maybe why I was acting out at school. Every night it was just me and my little brother since my dad worked late. After he finished eating, he said suddenly, Oh yeah, the phone. I need the phone. My younger brother was four years old, by the way. Hey, what? What are you talking about? I need the phone. He kept repeating while running off. Our home phone was in the hallway, and he ran in that direction. I was confused, so I went after him. He was trying to reach the phone on the phone table in the hallway. He was on his tiptoes, and he nearly had it. He was whining and asking for the phone. No, you can't play with that. Who are you going to call anyway? Are you trying to speak to mum? She's not coming back from the hospital yet. He started to cry, and he shouted at me to hurry up and give him the phone. I had to pick him up and drag him back to the living room, kicking and screaming. He really wanted that phone. Just then, the phone began to ring. The second my brother heard it, he started struggling against me, more and more. Screaming about how it was his phone, etc. I said, just wait there, I'll go get the phone for you because you can't reach it. He suddenly stopped his tantrum, and then waited patiently for me to bring him the phone. It was pretty weird, but it was about to get a whole lot weirder. Hello? I said as I answered the phone. I will keep my brother's name anonymous, just in case. Um, um, yeah, can I speak to Thomas, please? The voice belonged to an older woman, in about her fifties, I'd say. It wasn't a voice I recognized. It was really strange. I wondered what the hell a stranger in their fifties would want to speak to a four-year-old about. Who's calling? I asked. Ah. Uh, just a friend. Huh? A friend? I hung up. I was really confused. I walked back into the lounge and I saw my little brother sat there, on the sofa, grinning at me. Did you give our number to some old lady? I asked him. He said nothing. How long have you been speaking to this old lady? Then he said, I don't understand. I don't know. I hate this. I walked back to the phone and checked the caller ID for the number. It was our area code, but I didn't recognize the number. I tried to call it back a few times, but every time I tried, the line was busy. 
Meanwhile, my mum came home from the hospital and I explained what had happened. Mum looked pretty freaked out. She was just as unaware of this as I was. From that day onwards, we got calls from that number every now and then. It was so weird. Anytime my parents went out, about two minutes later, the phone would ring. My little brother would start shouting and screaming for the phone and then, when I answered, the old lady hung up. Whenever I called back, the line was always engaged. I moved the phone to a really high place that only I could reach when I was stood on a stool. I didn't want that horrible voice speaking to my brother again. A few weeks later, I had used the phone to speak to the police about the old lady and the nuisance calls. Once again, I was home alone with my brother. My parents weren't home, and I can't remember where they were. I was in the bathroom and I heard the phone ringing. I thought, ah, oh, it's that old woman again. I heard my little brother running to the hallway. Like I said, I was in the bathroom, so I thought to myself, oh well, he can't reach it. Then I heard this horrible, clattering sound. My brother then said, Hello, hello. When I came out of the bathroom, I was surprised to see that he had pulled the phone line with enough momentum to bring the phone down from the high place I had put it. I ran straight over to him. He was lying on the floor, happily chatting away. Yeah, sure. Come and play, yeah. I snatched the phone out of his hand, and I put it to my ear, but all I heard was a dial tone. From that day forward, my brother never jumped up and down and went crazy when the phone rang, and there were no further calls from that number either. I called it, and the number is no longer in use. Seven years has passed since then, and my brother says he doesn't remember it at all. Anytime my parents or I bring it up, he always scowls and accuses us of lying. I'm worried about what might have happened. I'm worried that he's hiding something. I've been living alone in Tokyo for the past two years. My apartment building is a pretty central location and alongside the railway tracks. My apartment isn't the biggest, but it's good enough for me. As soon as you walk in through the front door, you pretty much step into the kitchen. There are two other rooms towards the back of the apartment. It's just a very ordinary apartment. It's a comfortable enough place to live in, nice sized bedroom and living room. One issue is, sometimes the electricity goes out, especially the lights. I always thought this was down to passing trains, living so close to the tracks and all. So what usually happens is, I hear the sound of an approaching train and brace myself for a possible blackout. After a few seconds, all the lights would come back on. The breaker never gets tripped though. It was just an odd quirk of the apartment. I didn't like it at first, but I soon grew to live with it. I didn't understand why it did that, but I guessed it was just down to faulty wiring or something. I didn't mind. It usually happened around the time I would take a bath. One night I came home after working really late. Usually I would prepare my evening meal before taking the bath. I checked the time and it was seven minutes past midnight. Shortly after, I heard the familiar sound of the train approaching. And then the lights went out. The lights going out in the bathroom had sort of become part of my nightly routine. And because I was in the kitchen, not the bathroom, when the lights went out, it really spooked me. I looked up and my eyes were drawn to the living room. The whole apartment was in total darkness. I noticed that something was off. And then I saw it. There was a shadowy figure stood in the middle of my living room. It was definitely a human. I could tell by the outline. It was unbelievably frightening to see this shadow person in my living room. It knew I had seen it. It turned to face me and started moving across the room towards me. I was frozen in horror. As it drew closer, it raised its right arm, and just as it came within an arm's length of me, the lights came back on. With the apartment now lit again, I could see everything. The laminate floors, the walls, living room, they were all the same. There was no shadow in my apartment anymore. I looked around for a reasonable explanation for what I had just seen, but I couldn't find anything. 
At one point, I thought it might have been a trick of the lights outside, but that was a very tenuous conclusion. The black shadow, or shadow person, is still in my room. It seems as if it only appears in the living room. If you are in the bathroom, or hall, you won't see it. I should really move apartments, or get some help to cleanse mine. I don't know where to start with all that, though. It happens, always at the same time. Seven minutes past midnight. I have to make sure I'm in a different room. It's good that I know how to live with it for the time being, but there have been some close calls. I'm worried about coming home drunk one night and falling asleep on the sofa. That thought really frightens me. This happened to me a number of years ago, when I was in high school. I haven't told anyone about this, so maybe writing it will give me the confidence to share. Many years ago I lived in a small mountain town, and there were many beautiful places there. There was a shrine at the top of the mountain. It was an Inari one. Halfway up the mountain was an old air raid shelter, a well, and a graveyard. All the kids in town called that whole area scary. Kids at school always dared one another to go up there, especially at night, to test their courage. Eventually, my friends and I decided that we were going to go up there to see what all the fuss was about. One of my friends didn't believe in ghosts and wasn't one to get spooked easily. We arrived at the area with the well. It was surrounded by weeds, but we could see an old wooden cover resting on top of the well. There was a huge stone on top of the cover, and it was held in place with some sort of wire. We all speculated as to why this was. Why did a well need to be so heavily covered? We should have been more concerned than we were. We went up to the top of the mountain to check out the old shrine, but it didn't really phase us too much. Since we weren't as freaked out as we hoped to be, we decided that we'd all sneak out at midnight and meet back up and see what the mountain was like in the dark. When the time came, we ascended the mountain with flashlights in hand. We first went to check out the old air raid shelter, and then the graveyard. We were getting mildly spooked out. Nothing major though. You know, just over-talkative. The moon was big and bright that night, so we could see quite well. Next, we approached the well, and for some reason I really wanted to see what was in there. I prepared for it too. I brought some pliers and a screwdriver from home to remove the cover. Lucky for us, the wire was rusted, and it came off almost instantly. With everyone working together, we were able to move the heavy stone off of the well cover. We were working together, and the sense of community was fun. You know, like a kind of heave-ho level of cheering broke out amongst us boys. When the heavy stone finally toppled, we all roared with excitement. That's a great memory for me. What comes next isn't so much. We all gathered around and shone our torches into the well. There was some old faded writing on the underside of the well cover. It looked religious. I didn't really understand it. The stench that came out from the cover being removed was disgusting. We all simultaneously took a step back. Some of my friends were freaked out and wanted to leave. I wanted to keep looking, and some of my other friends did too. I raced back to the mouth of the well. We peered into the well, despite the brave faces we were putting on, I think we were all apprehensive. Inside the well was pitch black. We shone our torches, but we couldn't see to the bottom. We felt the cold air rise out from the pit of the well. There must have been water down there. Some friends began to shout into the well to see how much their voices echoed. One of them even spat down there. We all strained our ears to try and find out how deep it was. We expected the echo of water rippling to reverberate through the well, but what came back was something unexpected. The sound that came back was a scratching sound. No one said a word, but we could tell from one another's flashlight lit faces that we were all puzzled and creeped out. We all stayed silent to try to hear what sound would come next. The scratching continued and then doubled in sound. Someone asked what the sound was. No one had a reply. 
I took the cover off of the well. I illuminated it with my flashlight and saw countless scratch marks on the underside of the cover. A horrible thought came to me. The cover, the wire, and the stone wasn't to keep everyone out, but perhaps to keep something in. I felt for sure that that something was climbing up the walls of the well. That's what that noise was. I just ran for it without explaining myself. Everyone looked surprised and gave chase behind me. We found one another again at the bottom of the mountain, and we headed to an all-night restaurant to talk about what had happened. Everyone looked pale. One of my friends didn't believe that some of us saw the scratch marks on the underside of the well cover. He said that he wanted to go back and check. No one wanted to go with him. This is where the story gets away from me a little bit, because when my friend who didn't believe in seeing the scratch marks went home, he said he saw long, fresh scratch marks in his family home's door. He also said he saw someone wearing a mask nearby. I don't know if he's trying to scare me, but there were scratch marks on his door. I saw them for myself. We went back to the shrine at the top of the mountain the next day and prayed for our safety. Nothing happened after that. I don't know if it's all one big coincidence, but it scared the hell out of me. Thankfully, we're all doing alright still. <laughs>